I'm Janet Cox. I lead Climate Action California, and I want to welcome everybody to part two of our two-part legislative training. The version we did in December covered how the legislature works in Sacramento, and today we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of climate advocacy and how we lobby our legislators. Um, we have um, panelists today from Third Act and from the Climate Reality Project, and I think it's, it's going to be a good session. I especially want to thank our co-sponsors, Third Act and the Climate Reality Project California Coalition, our in this with us all the way, and um, it's really been great working with them. I'm going to turn it over now to Sheila Dershowitz from Third Act and Kathy Schaefer from Climate Reality, just to say a few words. So, Sheila, over to you. Thank you, Janet. Um, I'm Sheila Dershowitz, and I am with Third Act of Southern California. Third Act SoCal. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome everyone this afternoon, our partners from Climate Action California and Climate Reality, and a special welcome to the many Third Act volunteers from all over California. All three California chapters, which in Third Act we call working groups, are here today, San Francisco Bay Area, Sacramento, and of course, SoCal, where the idea for this legislative training originated months back. We are so grateful to Janet Cox, who, who immediately embraced the idea when we first approached her. And she and her team have worked tirelessly on this project, along with our own Third Act SoCal member, Joan Zierler, whose background in film and video production have been just invaluable skills. And thank you to Deborah Moore, a Third Act campaign strategist, for your leadership and support, Deborah. Some of you may not be familiar with Third Act, so I want to take a moment to tell you something about us. Third Act was founded about two years ago by Bill McGibbon, and our mission at Third Act is twofold. To try to protect our fragile climate and our endangered democracy, and we see these two goals as closely linked. Learning to advocate together to impact climate legislation and policy is exactly what Third Act is all about. So thanks to every one of you for being here today and for your commitment to this important work. Thank you, Sheila and Kathy. Hello, I'm Kathy Schaefer from Climate Reality Project. The Climate Reality Project was founded by former Pri Vice President Al Gore, and it's a network of over 3.5 million people worldwide working to eliminate sources of greenhouse gases and build a more sustainable future for the planet. There are climate reality chapters throughout the world, with 13 of them, and over 4,000 members in the California Coalition. And we are just very happy to be a part of this training today. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, and I have to say that uh, Climate Action California really was able to up our game when the Climate Reality Project California Coalition joined us a couple of years ago. So it's it's been a tremendous partnership. So I want to turn it over to Mary Buxton, who is going to open the meat of this training. Hi, everybody. I am Mary Buxton. I joined um, Climate Action California. I've been working with this group for over seven years. Um, and it's my retirement career. And um, I'm here to talk about effective citizen lobbying, like the big overview. Um, and things I'll, I do a lot of scheduling with legislative offices for group meetings. So I don't want that to intimidate people who are doing more individual, you know, just speaking up for their opinion as an individual, because everybody is going to participate in their own way at their own level, you know, throughout time. 
So I don't mean to overwhelm anyone. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so lobbying can have a negative connotation because people often think lobbying means you're paid by some big corporation to push their uh, point of view and that's not what we're doing. We're doing citizen lobbying, which is not paid. And we're doing it out of our concern and passion. So why lobby? Um, one, you wanna influence your legislators vote and get the kind of laws passed that will protect our environment and the climate for us and our future generations. We advocate for specific bills in the Senate and assembly we um, we're trying uh, to promote our interests, our core beliefs, positive changes. Um, and we also do a lot of educating for the legislator and the staff and maybe draw their attention to certain bills that they you know weren't that aware of, but that we've assessed as pretty strong bill. Um, and you'll hear me say over and over again, build and build a positive relationship with your representative and protect it. Next slide, please. Okay, why is it important to make your case? Well, it's like being assertive about what you believe in. The legislators and their staff can't know everything because there are 2,500 bills um, every session and that's just a lot of bills and a lot of detail to stay on top of. So other people need to inform them, and we're some of those other people. We study the bills, we decide what our priorities are, and then we try to set up meetings to go talk to them about it. Um, and then if we don't do that, um, the representatives will only hear from the professional lobbyists, in industry, and political interests who may not have the climate and the environment as uh, center focus as much as we do. Next slide, please. Okay, I love this slide because there's different ways you can influence your representative's vote. So what it's be a number, be a person, be a resource. Okay, so be a number. It's just you're a tally mark. You can sign on to online petitions. You can call or email your the Sacramento office of your representative. And when you do call, you just want to say, hey, I'm Mary Buxton, Climate Action California, and I support bill number, blah, blah, blah. And that's that's what you do there. Um, for being a person, you want to make yourself known. And you try to get to places locally where you can meet the staff or meet the representative. Say, like, going to a town hall meeting, and you could take that opportunity to speak out and introduce yourself, always introduce yourself because they meet a lot of people. And even though they may know you, they may misplace you in their memory. Um, and it's always good. And we always start meetings by thanking our legislator and the staff for the work that they do and something specific they've recently done. Um, the third role would be to be a resource. And this is where um, you uh, schedule uh, meetings to talk about policy with an environmental aid, and usually that's done as a group. Uh, and you provide information that supports your position on a bill or issue. And it, since this group has been working together, they have people who have pretty deep knowledge on issues. So um, it can be uh, very helpful for the legislators to have us support different issues. And finally, always build that professional relationship with your representative and their staff. And um, you wanna always be positive, professional and informative with them. Um, so, the, <clears throat> okay. And then one thing I forgot to mention under being a resource that uh, one time I had an assembly, two assembly members call because I was the person doing most of the scheduling and say, would could you put on a town forum on climate? And we were all over that. <laughs> it was great. So that was an example of, you know, regular positive meetings. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, 
So who lobbies and how? So we're citizen lobbyists versus paid lobbyists. So paid lobbyists are paid by special interests. We are not paid and we volunteer um, out of our concern and passion for a certain issue. Paid lobbyists bring campaign cash and what we bring is grassroots support. And how that looks is on these Zoom calls, we might have 15 to 30 people attending from different, um, they're not always constituents, but that, you know, it shows that the public is aware and concerned. Um, a paid lobbyist communicates a single clear objective or message about the issue. And we might have several objectives, but we're always trying to narrow that down so we can have greater impact on the main message. Uh, paid lobbyists are often doing their work in the Capitol in Sacramento, and the citizen lobbyist is often in the district until COVID. And COVID, um, we started with doing these Zoom meetings to meet with people, to attend hearings, you name it. And um, that made things way more democratic because people who can't go to a local office or to Sacramento might be able to be on Zoom. So it's way more democratic as a result of that. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing is sometimes you're going to be speaking for yourself. Uh, I also volunteer with the Sierra Club and on certain issues, I cannot speak for the Sierra Club. So sometimes I just sign things through Climate Action California as me, not, I don't mention Sierra Club unless I know they represent, they approve of that bill at that time and probably have permission. So yeah, that's back to that. You might have different hats that you wear at different times. Next slide, please. Now, I guess I keep going back to this. Sometimes you will participate as an individual and but a lot of times you're going to be advocating as part of a group, and that group might be your primary organization or a coalition of organizations across the state or in your area that um, you're a part of. So it's really important to remember if you're representing a part of an advocacy group that you're it's not you. It's what the mess the agreed on message that you're trying to uh, pass on. And it's really good to work in coordination with other climate groups. Uh, we were fortunate enough to start to work with Climate Reality several years ago, and that has been very, very um, productive for everyone. Um, all the collaboration, uh, we base it on mutual respect and support. It's really important to include environmental justice groups and their concerns um, because they have often been left out of the discussion, had no voice, but suffered the major impacts from climate because they are frontline communities, say, on, uh, you know, different areas around um, oil and gas or sea level rise. Um, the other thing that is really interesting is that legislators love youth and young adults. So if you can ever include them or collaborate with their youth organizations on meetings, it's uh, a good idea. One, there was one local representative who was visited by a first grade class who were, they were there this several years ago to talk to him about uh, passing a bill that would ban plastic straws with their lunch. And he voted right in line with their wishes. And I just think they, they love the youth. So it's always good to include them. Um, and uh, usually you have a pre-meeting, so you agree on a consistent message and the roles for people and try to stick to that, not contradict each other. Don't hijack the meeting for a single issue, um, but just work as part of a team. Next slide, please. Okay. Relationships are vital, and I just feel so privileged to be able to... Um, meet with these legislators and staff who are all extremely smart, hardworking people. Um, our goal and purpose is to pass important climate legislation now in the future. That's what all this is about. And so what it's more fun and way more 
uh, successful if you keep um, good relationships mean future access. And here's an example of that. I um, had a, set up a meeting, uh, this is years ago, and I was not able to attend the meeting, which was a mistake in retrospect. But um, during that meeting, which was only 30 minutes, two people got up and left after 15 minutes. And then um, the staff person overheard one of the members um, make some type of a sarcastic comment after the meeting and was so offended. She's told the legislative director she never wanted to work with this group again. Well, so I spent and I wrote her an apology letter and talked to her. And then I also spent an hour. It was called by the legislative director and spent an hour doing relationship repair which I did, but it just would have been better. And the other side of that is I thanked one person early on for seeing us so many times about the bill SB 100 when I first started out. I just felt they were tremendously generous with their time. And her response was, well, you know what? Your group is always civil and prepared, and we're happy to meet with you at any time. So that was pretty good feedback. Um, so meeting with staff members can be very useful. Sometimes they know way more than the legislator about a specific issue. And uh, because they're assigned to bills and, you know, they have more time to talk and they've gone deeper in the analysis. Um, capital legislative staff are usually more knowledgeable than district staff. Um, and all of them can be excellent resources and conduits for our views. So it's very important to be very respectful when we meet with them. And it's important to meet with legislators who don't share your views and listen to them to hear what their concerns are, and then uh, make an effort to educate and express why your point of view seems uh, valid. To, and maybe they'll um, maybe they'll move more towards you. Okay, uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, you need to research your representative, and sometimes it's very helpful that you have team members who know have been to other meetings or know this person or have time to help you with the research. You want to know the district demographics and to who to whom is your representative accountable. We just went through uh, in 2020 the redistricting, so things have recently changed in this area. Um, have a knowledge of bills that representative has authored and co-authored, and you can find that looking on their website, uh, going to Ballotopedia, I'm not sure how to say that correctly, going to LegInfo, which all that we covered last session. Um, Let's see, Sierra Club and California Conservation Voters both have report cards, scorecards on how uh, legislators vote. So there are ways to research that. Um, the representatives, uh, what was their voting record on climate bills in the last session? What, what are their top issues and viewpoints? And often that's addressed by trying to get them to talk more than us at the meetings. Um, and what are their committee assignments? Do they chair committees? And that helps you know if they're interested in natural resources or tech issues or, or what. And know who the influence is and key financial backers. And some, um, I think Senator Becker, Assembly Members Lee and Cholera are three that I know of that take no uh, oil money um, because they don't want it influencing their vote or even having the impression. Next slide, please. Um, back to building relationships. Okay, there's some really fun ways that you can have access to your legislators and staff. Uh, I'll just give you a few examples. Assemblyman Pellerin, who is new to my area, she's my representative, has a pause in policy at the local dog park on uh, one Saturday morning a month. Uh, Senator Allen takes people on hikes down in Southern California. Uh, Anna Eshu, who's a Congress, U.S. Congresswoman, has bi-monthly calls that you can get on the list and they just call you when they're having the meetings. Um, uh, county supervisor up here in Santa Clara County, uh, Joe Simidian, has sidewalk talks. So um, I've even been invited twice to join a Fourth of July 
parade with a, le a legislator. And I haven't been able to do that because I'm out of town, but it just, there are a lot of fun ways of where it's just people to people to meet people and always introduce yourself in your organiza organization every time and don't assume they remember you. Uh, volunteer for their campaigns, um, first elections or re-elections. Uh, and let their legislative director know which bills you support. And it's really good, and we often organize this as a group, that when something passes that we've all worked on, we write thank you slash congratulation notes to them. Um, and then the staff members often move up the ladder. Uh, we have a couple here locally who are now were legislative directors and are now running for office. Um, so I've even in the past, when someone was moving on to a new job, offered to write a letter of appreciation, and they really appreciated that because they keep a portfolio for, you know, as they apply for new jobs. Next slide, please. Um, this one is when to schedule a meeting. And if you have a new representative, get to know them. You want to meet with them, explain who you are. They can get a sense of your style and you can get a sense of theirs. Uh, early in the legislative cycle, you want to meet with them to discuss what your organization or coalition thinks is important in terms of issues, bill ideas, and particularly find out what the representative plans for the session. Um, and we always call to push specific bills uh, or a committee vote. And the legislators are often in the office in the district on Fridays and often during a recess. Um, next slide, and I believe this is the last one. So you got to make the appointment. Um, I always go, because sometimes I get corrected if I try to <laughs> rest on my laurels, um, that I always go to the official website for the senator or assemblyman and, you know, use the uh, set up a meeting link and do that first. Then I put it on. Now, this is a scheduling role that may be way too specific. And then I start a whole follow up process once a week and I might use the, uh, you know, the personal information I have from working with them before, after I have done the formal outreach. And, uh, and just say, hey, I didn't hear from you. We were looking forward to meeting, you know, follow up that way. Uh, you can phone Sacramento and find out who's in charge of what. They are super helpful and friendly when you call them. And um, you always, you know, who you explain who you represent and why you would like a meeting. Is it to discuss bill ideas, to find out what they're thinking about? Is it about a specific bill? Um, is it to educate because you have some interesting new uh, information that they may not have seen? Um, and then um, I already talked about do the follow up and you need to be organized and not forget about it. Uh, and then we always set up who's going to clarify who's going to set up the Zoom call uh, that I will send a list of attendees as well as a specific agenda prior to the meeting so that they have time to set up the legislator with that information. And with that, I am done. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Janet. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, you can all see that Mary is our secret weapon. Uh, she's been on the front lines talking to legislators and their staffers for a long time. They know her. She knows them. They're all happy to talk to her. It's really a gift. And um, in some ways, I think if you if you have somebody with exalted social skills like Mary has, this is a great way to use a volunteer because um, it's just it's just been golden for us. And we're just grateful to Mary every time. Um, so I just want to talk for a second. Uh, there, there are really two kinds of meetings, and you'll handle them a little bit different. The, in, the, the kinds of meetings where you are just getting to know a new legislator or it's the beginning of the session, or you know you're pitching a list of bill ideas as 
Climate Action California has been have it has been doing it's um it's it's sort of a general meeting and the goal is really to get the legislator talking and so we tend to build the agenda around questions that the legislator can answer and the other thing is that since we've been meeting on zoom it's been a real advantage to be able to bring more people into the meetings but the meetings have also gotten shorter so we'll often only have 15 or 20 minutes and we've gotten pretty good at making those 15 or 20 minutes count but um it's still important in that case to allow the to set it up so that the legislator does most of the talking for that 15 or 20 minutes on the other hand if what you're doing is going in to pitch a particular bill and there are a lot of groups that have been advocating for quite a while for sb 252 the divestment bill then you're going to run it a little differently you'll have people who are in the meeting ready to tell a brief story about why this bill is important to them some element of personal history that matters i mean if you have a calpers member who can go in and say this is why i really support this bill um it makes sense so it's just you just have to be clear when you're organizing the meeting um about what the purpose of it is, and that's going to drive your agenda. Next slide, please. So um, it, it's nearly always on Zoom. And we have had a couple of sort of, of newish legislators this year who wanted to meet in person. We've sort of, what? We don't do that anymore. But we've um, we've also found that hybrid meetings don't work too well, where you have some people in the office and other people on Zoom. So. Um, my bias is really in favor of Zoom meetings, um, but uh, you, you, you sort of have to go with whatever they're going to ask for. So um, actually, we do a huge amount of work ahead of time. By the time we get to the meeting, it sort of just happens. But there is a lot of organizing and planning that goes into it and I think it pays off in the way Mary was describing when the staffer said, and you're always so organized. So we put together a document that um, we call an agenda, but it doesn't really look like any agenda you ever met. Um, it's often a list of our priority issues and bills and we know going in that there isn't gonna be time to discuss them all. Um, it's really a leave behind sort of statement about what we care about. And in some cases, we always get this to the legislator before the meeting. And in some case they will some case they will have gone over it and be prepared to discuss our favorite ideas. or in other cases, you know, we'll have a couple that are the prime, reasons that we want to have this conversation and we'll just try to hit a couple of them but we'll still leave that document with the legislator and staff next next slide please so um again i think it's it's That's just awesome. really important to um set it up so that the legislator has time to talk and uh, we also always set up a pre-meeting an hour or so ahead of the meeting. Not everyone who is going to attend the meeting comes, but it's helpful to kind of discuss the agenda with the folks who are going to be on the call and find out if there, you know, if there may be individuals who are going to be especially helpful to talk about specific bills if there's time to do that. And it's, and you know, we always try to be organized enough to know who's going to open the meeting and sort of 
ask the organizing questions, moderate the conversation, which is really important. This really takes some serious fa facilitation sometimes. Um, and who's going to close? So um, the other thing to just note is that these are th these meetings are really great opportunities for people who don't have a lot of experience lobbying or talking to their legislators to just just get a sense of what it feels like. And they're, you know, we'll have 15 or 20 people on a call sometimes, and maybe only four or five max will talk. And that's perfectly fine. So it's just, it's a great opportunity to just kind of be there and learn. And next time you may want to have a speaking part. Next slide, please. So um, just a couple more things. Uh, we always ask at the beginning how much time a person has available, and it's really important to watch the clock and not go over. Um, we normally ask everyone to put their name in their little Zoom squares. And if, if it's only 15 or 20 minutes, then we've got 10 or 15 people on the line. We're not going to introduce ourselves. So, but the legislator has the list. And, you know, we just try to make it a comfortable conversation that hits our points. Um, it's really important not to argue and not to lecture. You really have to assume, especially when you're talking to a staff member who has been assigned to climate bills or the environment, they, they do know their stuff and we don't have to convince them. So I think um, you just try to have the friendliest possible interesting conversation and it really works. Next slide. So just, I, I feel like we're saying this eight different ways, but it's so important. Um, just have to be ready to listen, ready to be flexible, but prepared to bring the conversation back to your topic. Um, Follow-up questions are really helpful. And, um, you know, often we'll leave with an assignment to send back information about something that we've talked about, and you have to do that right away. It's also helpful to, if the when the legislator is carrying a bill that we really care about, we want to know how we can help. And we can bring some muscle to bear to help. And um, that's one of the reasons I think that they want to keep talking to us. Um, so, and then I just have to say that sometimes some of the best conversations are the ones we have with ourselves, not with the legislator on the line, before the call and after the call. And you know, the, one of the odd things about this organization we've been building for the last couple of years is that because we're statewide, we're practically always on Zoom, and it really works as a community. And it, you can tune into our meetings and see what I mean, but um, some of the conversations that we've had before or after meetings with legislators have been really useful for all of us. So I think that's it from me. And I want to turn it over to Kathy, who is gonna get into more detail about how we make our views known. So thank you for listening. Okay, next, um, I would like to just um, preface my part of the presentation by saying that there are so many ways to participate in the legislative process as an individual or as a volunteer or a staff person in an organization. There are, are many organizations that are also part of coalitions and through coalition meetings or messaging and, and testifying can be 
coordinated with other groups, and it's very powerful. It's important that individuals take advantage of the resources that their organizations provide. I'll be talking about a variety of options. I, Janet and Mary have really covered the meeting process well. I'm going to be talking about some other options. Um, and th there are just so many opportunities to be involved. Your work is important, whether you know it or not, no matter how much or how little time you have to spend, whatever you do is important. And I hope that you'll participate in any way that works best for you. So on to our first slide. We're not very quiet sometimes. We want to make sure that our message is heard. We can make phone calls to express support or opposition of a bill. It's the easiest way and the fastest action you can take. So you grab the phone number off the legislator's website, you make a phone call, you say, hello, uh, this is my name, I'm calling about this bill, and I am in support. Thank you very much. Super fast, super easy, and you're, you're vote is counted by the legislator's office. The staff member who answers the phone, this was my fear at the very beginning when I started doing this stuff. I was so nervous I was gonna make a mistake. But these people who answer the phone are so kind and so patient. And I, I've never run into someone who was nasty or even a little bit impatient. So the staff members, uh, we'll answer the phone, they'll take your comment, and you'll say your, your piece. And you don't need any lengthy explanation for what for your rationale, because they're really busy and they don't have time to listen to a lot of what you say, uh, besides what your opinion is very quickly. Um, a big part of advocacy is knowing that it's okay to call your legislator's office. You can always can call about the bills you're supporting, but you can also call if you need information. The people who answer the phone, again, they understand that this is their job to be the, the face of the legislator's office and understand that helping constituents is a huge part of their job. You should always call the Sacramento office if you're making a call about a specific bill or a statewide issue. If you're calling about a district issue, call the local district office. Those people know how to help you better. Um, next slide, please. At Senate or Assembly committee hearings, the legislators will discuss a bill and then one or two experts selected by the author of the bill will provide some expert testimony. Following the testimony, anyone can add their two cents, their support or opposite, opposition. This is called a me too phone call, technical term, it's a me too. It's a simple one sentence statement you're not allowed to say anything else. You're calling into this very semi-formal hearing and you're, you, there are rules. And if you say more than you're allowed to, the chair can tend to get a little annoyed and might hang up on you. Uh, they, they will cut you off if you go too long. So a me too sounds like this. Hello, my name is so-and-so. I am here on behalf of Climate Action California or or third actor, or whatever your group is. Um, and I, we are in support of the bill. Thank you very much. And you hang up and that's it. And it's so, it's really fast and easy to do. Uh, the hard thing is waiting, waiting through the hearing until they get to your bill. Um, individuals can also call in uh, but you're not going to say the, the, the name of the group that you are associated with. You can call in, you say you, your name, the city you live in or where you live, the area you live in, and then you just say if you're opposed or um, in support of the bill. The directions for how to call into the committee website during a hearing is a little complicated the first time. Um, I'm going to, when we finish this piece, I'm going to these slides, I'm gonna to go to the committee websites with you and kind of show you um, where to find the information so that you it won't be new to you if you haven't seen it before. Um, it's also, when you are getting ready to do a Me Too statement, it's also um, important to call in at the very beginning 
of the hearing. And I will tell you, they never or almost never start on time, but you still have, you still have to be there when they start. Um, some because, and this is for your benefit, sometimes the bills will be on a consent calendar uh, and not be heard. Or sometimes the author will be, will pull a bill at the very last minute. And so the agenda is all messed up and you don't want to spend your next two or three hours waiting for your bill to say your one sentence um, if the bill isn't going to be heard. Also, what you need to know is the agenda does not always go in order. So you have to, to really, when you're waiting for your, your call, your turn to speak, you need to make sure that you're listening for your bill. It's really important to do these Me Too's for a lot of reasons. We It supports the author and the, the bill. Um, if you call in, well, you know, I'll, I'll use Janet as an example. Uh, she doesn't even have to say who she is on the call. They know who she is. They say, hey, Janet. <laughs> so you, when you are supporting the author, when you're supporting the bill, and it's developing that relationship that Mary talked about, it's so important. Um, when you have your people call in, it develops a recognition for your group and whatever the position is on your bill. The committee process is actually really interesting. I hated government in school, uh, in, in my government classes, but actually being in a hearing room or, or participating in a, in a meeting is so interesting and really informative. You learn a lot about the specific bill that they're discussing. Um, so you can go out on the street and talk about it in a really knowledgeable way. And you learn about committee procedures and the legislative process that too many of our citizens actually don't understand. So we, uh, Mary talked a little bit about COVID. Before COVID, public comment in the committee hearings uh, could only be made in person in Sacramento. How last century was that, right? During COVID, the phone calls into the committee hearings and um, assembly, Senate and Assembly committee hearings were allowed and we got super spoiled by that and it is great. After COVID now, after COVID, the Senate has maintained the policy for calling in, but the assembly unfortunately did not. Uh, it was left up to the committee chairs whether or not they would allow calls into their committee. And more often than not, they didn't permit calls. And we at Climate Action California and Climate Reality think that this is really not fair. Every, Cal you know, every Californian, should be allowed to weigh in on potential legislation, whether or not you can travel and go into the Capitol uh, in Sacramento to offer your opinion. So we have developed a position, a petition that we would like you to sign and share. And the petition is for Senator uh, Speaker Rivas to hear our concerns and change the policy so it's consistent and does the same as the Senate. So um, you see the slide. And I think there's going to be a link in the chat and we're gonna give everybody one minute to please go ahead and, and sign that uh, petition. So we'll, we'll take a short intermission here. Just as an aside, we got up to almost a thousand signatures in two days and lots of organizations have signed on and we're very proud of that. Um, and you should also be sure to share this link with all of your friends and colleagues in all of your acquaintances and organizations. So technically, this should have only been mean to write your name on there. So we should all be pretty, I know a lot of people have already signed it. So thank you. I think we can go on to our next slide. Okay. Putting your opin opinion into a written document 
can be very powerful. Depending on your personal goal in all of this business and any affiliation you have with a group will determine your options. So there are some super easy things to do and there are some more complex things to do. Anyone, anyone can and should feel free to go to a legislator's website and click on the contact link to submit a personal email that expresses your opinion. You will only be able, that contact link will only work for your own assembly person, however. It won't take your comment if you don't live in the district. For the Senate contact um, links, anybody can put in a comment. Um, I believe, Janet, you may want to correct me on that. No, I think you have to be in the Senate district too. It's the, it's the U.S. Um, senators um, that can, you, anybody can write a letter to any of them, an email to any of them. Um, so the contact form, super easy, super fast. You get to say your piece. Um, if you're a part of a larger group, you can watch for action alerts via email and you can sign your name to a letter that's already been written. In some instances, you can have an opportunity to personalize the message. If your group has a legislative team, you can connect with them to be part of writing more formal letters for the legislative record. Most organizations like Third Act or Climate Reality or, or CAC have positions and processes in place, and there are resources within your group to help you advocate the best way, uh, especially when you're doing written communication. Next slide, please. A formal position letter typically has a lot of detail and can provide very strong support or opposition of a bill. These letters are usually written by organizations and they're submitted through the legislative website. Um, if you submit a letter, the name of your organization will be listed in the legislative analysis, which is kind of a big deal, and it pro because it provides positive rec recognition for your organization. Uh, I guess, or negative if the opposing side sees your, your name on there, like the some of the industries. Um, letters can be submitted by one organization, multiple organizations, or as an individual. Make sure that you don't submit a letter for your group if you don't have permission. You always want to run that by your, your folks in charge there. To write a, a, a position letter, first, most importantly, you have to do your research. You're writing something that's going to go into the public record. So you wanna read the bill and you wanna check with the experts that you have within your organization. Uh, and you probably, if you wait a couple of days, you can review other letters that people have submitted through, and because it is a public record, you can see them. Clearly, we're not going to plagiarize, but if you want to get some background information or look at some talking points that other groups are using, that might be helpful for you to write your letter. You, it's always helpful to work with a partner to make sure that you have your facts correct and that the letter is well written. The letter format is going to include your, your logo, the date, who it's addressed to. At the top of your letter, you're going to have one bold sentence that says the bill number, the title of the bill, and the word support or opposition. 90% of the time, I think, we I feel like we write support letters. Um, so that's probably what you're going to write the, uh, for your um, advocacy letters. The, the first paragraph typically has, people do this differently, by the way. I'm just giving you the, the general gist of it. Uh, the, the first paragraph is typically a just a summary of the bill um, and maybe, now, I, you know, you can put wherever you want in that opening paragraph, just the, the summary. The next paragraphs are, are the meat of it, why the bill should be supported and the rationale and, and all of your supporting, think back to, you know, high school English, your supporting statements. Um, and then you have your closing statement, again, reiterating your support and the author's names. Most bills will go through one or two committees for review and a vote. And then the letters 
will and the letters that we have submitted through the legislative website will be delivered to the committee staff and the author's staff member. A formal position letter must be submitted through the portal on the legislative website. And again, I'm going to zoom through the website when we finish this so just to show you where to find the, the directions. Adam spent in our first training, Adam spent quite a bit of time looking at Leginfo, and that was that was and part of the website. So that was really helpful as a precursor. Tips. Again, after writing so many of these letters, you get you you realize where you make mistakes and how to make it better next time. Proofread all the time. Proofread and then get someone else to proofread it for you. And maybe a third person. A fact sheet is my lifesaver. The bills, the language, when you read the bill, the language can be difficult. It can be a little convoluted, a lot of technical language in, in some of them. The fact sheet is something that is prepared by the legislator's office. It is a summary of the bill and the reasons why we should be supporting it in plain language. So if you read this fact sheet, then you go back to the bill and you say, oh my gosh, I get it now. So it's also the, the one of the most important things on the fact sheet is the person who is staffing the bill, their name and their phone number and their email are at the bottom of the page and they will answer any questions you have when you're writing your letter. They want your letter if you're supporting their bill. Um, so, oh, how to get a fact sheet. All you do is call the office. The, the person who answers the phone has all of the fact sheets on their computer. By the time you hang up the phone, it's already in your email. No problem. Just tell them the number of the bill and that you need a fact sheet. Um, oh, and the most important thing, do not miss the deadline. The deadlines are really hard to understand sometimes. So always get it in a little bit early so that you don't do all that work and miss the deadline. Next slide, please. For high profile or important legislation, your organization may want to create a sign-on letter. Uh, you've probably received some of those if you haven't written one yourself already, um, where you get an email and say, this is our position, this is our letter, we're going to submit it, please add your name to it. So how would you create one of those? Or why would you create one of those? You want to state your position. Again, it, it's going to be your organization. You're going to enlist other organizations for your cause, and you're going to provide recognition for all of your groups. So it's a great thing to do. How do you do it? You create your letter. You post it on a Google Doc. You send it out, share it to all the other organizations, and you ask them to add their logo on the top and their signature to the bottom. You set a deadline and sometimes remind people that the deadline's coming. You're gonna clean up that final letter, make it look pretty, save it as a PDF, and put it in through the portal on the legislative website. In the portal page, it will, it will allow you to select all of the organizations that have signed onto your letter. You really need to do that carefully because every single one of those organizations gets recognized in the legislative analysis. So you don't wanna leave it anybody off, they'll not be happy with you. Um, what if you don't have a bandwidth to submit a letter for your organization? Well, guess what? There is really good news here. Small or overburdened organizations don't always have the resources or personally, we don't have the bandwidth to do it at a certain time to create the sign-on letter. If that happens, it's okay. Sign on to someone else's letter if you get a request, especially if it's a letter that you know is going to go to the legislature. Um, and again, because when you write a sign-on, all their names are gonna be on the list. And if you sign on their letter, your, your group's name is going to go on the legislative analysis. So it's win-win. Okay, NASCAR. NASCAR letters. It's so funny. It, it's, it was a weird term. I didn't know what it was. Um, it's used by legislators, staff, lobbyists, anybody who works in Sacramento. And it's based on cars that are in NASCAR races who have decals 
from all of their sponsors all over their car. A NASCAR sign-on letter is a letter that has so many organizations, it takes one or two pages of just logos before you get to the body of the letter. It's a kind of a fun thing to, to, to see. And if you say you have a NASCAR letter, it's a big deal. Floor alerts are hard copies of the NASCAR letters. These are given out to the assembly members and senators on the day of a floor vote. After they've been through committees, they're gonna to go to the floor for the, the, the full body vote. And you, you want them to have your paper to, to remind them of how many groups are supporting this bill and that they need to vote accordingly. So that's kind of a fun thing too. Um, we are at a time where I can share my screen and quickly, quickly, so we can get to questions, go through, I think I have it. The, the state Senate website and the assembly website have the same information. Personally, I think the state website is easier to find stuff on, but um, they both have, have similar things. So when you are getting ready to make a, a Me Too phone call or to write a, a position letter, you are going to go to the committee website, let's go, for directions. Okay, so you go to the homepage for committees and then you see the list of committees. Uh, the assembly has similar committees. Sometimes they're named a little bit differently, but they have the same kind of kinds of committees. Um, we use the EUC one a lot for our work that we do. And so I'm gonna go to their committee website, hopefully. Okay, got your contact information. You see who you can, uh, check in with, and here's the directions for position letters. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. I'm gonna scroll down to, uh-oh. <laughs> they, they, they mine might have to go to, they took off their directions for their phone calls in the last 24 hours. <gasps> oh my, Janet, breaking news. Teleconference testimony during committee hearings will no longer be available. Whoa. Okay. We're going on the war path. Oh my gosh. That's terrible. This is brand new. And of we all have... committees. Ugh. Oh. Oh. Okay. Uh -oh. All right. We'll get over this shock. Maybe. We'll write in the position. I am so sorry that literally 24 hours ago, this was not here. So um, anyway, okay, I will regroup and not cry and talk to you about how to submit a position letter. You are again on the committee website. Click here. Um, you're going to um, sign in or register if you've never done this before. And I hope that's my correct password. Okay, yay. So it shows all the letters that you've written. You are going to click on submit a letter, easy peasy. You are going to choose the assembly bill or Senate bill. All these other things are resolutions that we typically don't write in on. Assembly bills, Senate bill, and we're gonna to go to Senate bill 499 because it did not get signed by the governor and it did not exit committee. So it's still kind of alive. We're not quite sure what's happening with it, but it's still listed here. Um, you can see all of the um, amendments and you're going to write a letter that is hopefully current with the amendments. Amendments happen fast and sometimes you don't know and sometimes they're major amendments and sometimes they're itty bitty amendments, but we have to play it by ear. And when Adam showed you ledge info, by the way, I hope you all took practice that. Ledge info is going to tell you what committee your letter is going to. It's going to tell you the last amendments. He showed you all this. All the amendments are shown. 
um, the history of the bill, who voted on it, in which committee. So use that leg info um, information that Adam gave you last time to, um, to get up to date. So the next page is who, who are you going to submit this for? Are you going to submit it for your group, for yourself as a person, which you can, or do you have a hopefully a NASCAR letter that you can just load on the, the organizations? I'm going to show you this one. Shows you that 499 is currently in the assembly. It passed through the Senate because we know from legit info, we passed that it passed through these assembly committees that was also on ledge info and it was in appropriations. So when we submit our letter, it's going to go to appropriations in theory and also to the staff person. Then we choose if we're supporting, opposing, support if amended, oppose unless amended. And then you're gonna type your subject And then you're going to go to your, P your uh, letter, the PDF. It has to be a PDF. You're going to choose it. And then you're going to click review. And the next page will show all of your answers, including your file. Make sure you attach the correct letter. If you have a bunch of letters, just double check it before you click submit. And you're good to go. And that is all I have to say. And I think there's another slide coming up. Oh, here we go. This is, these are just reminders. Oh, links, right. I, take it. I mean, I think Joan is putting the, the links in the chat at the end, um, how to use the portal, how to register, how to access the websites and get all that information. And next slide. And that's it. Well, I'm reeling from the news that the Senate Energy Committee is no longer taking phone comments. So we'll recast our petition and send it to both houses and amazing and terrible. Ugh. So... We must recover and move on. So do you have wonderful questions that are that you've been putting in both the chat and in the question box? And so over to Joan and Adam, who are going to play Stump the Stars or something. So actually, most of the questions have been answered on the way. Um, and I think you just answered Charles. Uh, he was asking about uh, the petition, how we were going to alter the petition given this new information. Oh my yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't think we'll hurt anybody's feelings who's already signed if we expand it to the Senate. No. Um, but, oh. Well, I hope you all signed and, and share it and we will we'll adjust the, the verbiage and send it to the Senate and the Assembly. It's more important now that even I'm, I'm, well, the interesting thing will be to look at some of the other committees because I, the chair of the Senate and Energy Committee is, um, I would expect him to be not thrilled with tons of, comments. Um, someone did put a question that I saw in the chat about asking whether the opposition also holds Zoom meetings with right. legislators. And I think it is a good question. Awesome. Uh, you know, what I think the answer is, is the opposition is normally like oil and gas, big Ag, the dairy lobby, um, the building trades unions that we are constantly finding ourselves at loggerheads with, they all have giant pots of money and lobbyists in Sacramento. And I think they are 
doing a, a tremendous, they're, they're putting huge amounts of pressure on everybody. They don't need to have Zoom meetings. They're taking them out to lunch. They're walking the corridors of the Capitol. And, um, and it's, we're really up against it at this point in the climate fight. And, and I think we have a lot going for us. One, we're right. And two, you know, we're trying to save lives on the planet. And the legislators kind of know that, or and some of them really know it. But it, it, as you'll see, if you um, participate in some of these hearings, I mean, we've been in situations where a, a bill was in one of the committees that was going to really make a difference for um, the setbacks, for instance, around oil and gas facilities. And the building trades and the oil and gas industries will have 200 people on the phone. And they'll and you know the, and they'll say we want to now we want to hear from people in favor of this bill and they'll all get on. Then they'll say now we want to hear people who are opposed to it. Nil. I mean we just can't get a word in, and that's the strategy. So it's um, we're up against it, and it's good. It's a good fight, and someday we're going to win. This is a question of how soon. So are there, are there other questions in there that we really should? Sure, there's one um, from Sally. Um, given this move by the Senate, should we bring that to the attention of the media, especially climate reports? Yeah, I think so. I think we need to do a press release. I was thinking about this today about our petition. And um, yeah, and if somebody has great media contacts or friends, call me up. And uh, we'll use those, but I think we really need to turn this on. Absolutely. Yeah, huh. There's another one. Maybe, maybe Kathy, you could address this one. And you know, we got asked what what the role of the the legislative director within an office is. But I, I think more broadly, it'd be good to talk about who are the staffers that are good to talk to. You know, like who who should people be asking for? Um. Well, I always ask for the legislative director, <laughs> but you know what, if they say no, they say no, but you know, the, again, that's about building relationships. You know, if your group is, is well known, it's a higher probability that you'll be able to speak directly to the ledge director. Um, but, but there, the aides are also very, very good. And sometimes they have aids that are specifically signed to the environmental issues. And yeah. they they are always good to talk to. Yeah, and sometimes when I call up, I will ask the person who answers the phone who, who the staffer is who's been assigned to the bill I'm talking about. And um, that's helpful because in you know a, a number of these offices, especially in the Senate, um, they they have a relatively big staff and they parcel out the bills. So, but the legislative director is always key. So let's see, someone else. Yeah, Lisa Swanson has a um, question about uh, legislators with terrible voting records. Uh, so any tips on what to focus on in a meeting with them? or a relationship with them? Well, there's always public health. Um, I mean, you know, I think we're pretty lucky in California. You know, we're not really up against climate deniers or um, you know, the, the kinds of people we hear quoted from Washington. Um, but I think it's just important to scour the record and try to find a couple of things that seem at least heading in the direction of our biases and 
play on those. But, you know, health of the people in the district mm -hmm. has, should always be a concern that we can talk about. I mean, sometimes we're not going to go in there banging a drum about climate change, but, um, you know, environmental justice is, a, is it should be an issue for everybody. And it just happens that the most conservative legislators are in districts with some of the most vulnerable communities that are at the greatest risk from oil and gas. Um, so I think this is I think this is also important. An important reason to before you go to a meeting to know your who you're talking to and what are the demographics of that district. And, and you know, there are some districts where you can you can discuss something from a financial perspective, or like Janet said, a public health perspective. If you if you go in as, you know, uh, I'm I I love nature. But, you know, that it's that might not resonate with some of those <clears throat> legislators, but to to understand their district and how you can help them frame it for their community is important. I just have to ask that people put their questions in the Q&A, please. Um, I think <clears throat> some are going into the chat and some people are raising hands. So. Um, you know, something that's really, I find really helpful is, um, yes, when you're listening to a hearing, especially if you're not allowed to speak, it's really frustrating. But um, but listening to the legislators discuss a bill is really educational. And I mean, what we're really doing, I think, is trying to figure out who these people are, where they're coming from, what matters to them, and especially on the bills that we care about. The, the way the hearings go is that the author presents the bill, and then there are um, expert witnesses in favor of it, and then sometimes expert witnesses opposing posing it then the people in the audience and on zoom if they let you do it um uh make their feelings known with their me too's and then before the vote the committee discusses and it's really helpful i find to listen to that conversation because you're going to find you're, you're going to get some good information about what's important to the people who are on the other side of our issues. And I, I really think the more you listen to those colloquies, the better you'll do going in and talking to them later. Uh -huh. Kathy, I think I have a question for you. What's a good source for finding demographics of districts? I, I think it's a lot of it is on each legislator's website. Right. Yeah. Go to the district page on each legislator's website. And normally under the map, there's a whole lot of demographic information. Or Wikipedia. That too. We had a, a good question about how how does lobbying at the state level differ, or is it the same as lobbying at the federal level? Oh, that was something we I really meant to talk about. Thanks. Um, it, it, it's really not that different in terms of setting up a meeting, preparing for it, and having the meeting um, from here. It's it's essentially the same, and. That's why the name of this um, session was in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., and we should have said more clearly at the beginning that, you know, if you're not, you know, walking the halls of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., it's it's really the same. You call up, you ask for 
an appointment. You, they may try to send you to the district staff, in which case I always say, can't we talk to somebody from Washington, D.C.? Um, just because sometimes the district is staffers is very focused literally on in district issues. But um, it's essentially the same. And um, we've had some wonderful meetings uh, with our Congress people and some of their staff and really gotten to know some of these people. And it's it's very it's very useful to do. It's also very discouraging these days to talk to congressmen because they are up against it, but um, still really interesting and helpful. Good question. So uh, this is an interesting question um, from Wyatt. If one of us has a bill idea or outline of a topic that could be looked into, is there a way it can be passed on to other Climate Action California members for additional input? If so, how and what would be the best, best way to do that? Well, just join us. <laughs> uh, uh, we have uh, Climate Action California organizes in teams that are focused on specific pollutant sources and types of emissions. And um, all of those groups have been working to think up bill ideas, which we have been proposing to legislators all over the state. It's We're, we're coming up, we've only got a couple weeks left before the rubber is going to have to meet the road on some of these things. But, um, you know, we'd be happy to welcome you to one of our teams and uh, talk over your ideas because that's what... You know, that's the payoff. That's the payoff for the good relationships is that they're willing to talk to us about what we think is important. And um, it's 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 really a wonderful state to be in after several years of people like Mary building those relationships so that they love talking to us. But, yeah, come on over. Uh, there's one other question, uh, uh, kind of related. Uh, Janet would like, would we be open to having guests come to a meeting to join during a meeting with a legislature? Of course, absolutely. And in fact, um, on our volunteer form, we can put a link to that in the chat at some point. It, 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 you can check the box that says that you are interested in joining meeting with meetings with legislators. And um, because we're meeting on Zoom, I include in when we are setting up one of those meetings, I invite everybody who has said they want to meet with legislators. And um, it's great to come and just be there and listen and you're welcome. And that is that is really something that's, that COVID did for us. Um, instead of you know trying to scrape up five constituents who are all available at 2.30 on Thursday, um, we can now have Zoom meetings that might be shorter, but um, they, we, they really do demonstrate to the legislator that we have a big coalition going and a lot of interested and a lot of people interested in their work. And I think that's about it. Going, going, gone. <laughs> well, thank you. And now a word from our sponsors. So Kathy. Ah, okay. Um, I, I, you know what? This, we have power. And especially when we have groups working together, we bounce ideas off each other and we participate with each other. And it really is um, a, a great thing. And at Climate Reality, 
every group has a little bit different focus. Climate reality is kind of, we we consider ourselves the, the boots on the ground kind of group. Um, there are groups that are really policy groups and, and do all that. We can mobilize people to make phone calls to their legislators and to, and to write emails. So we hope that you will uh, consider joining us for that. Over to Sheila, who has a whole slide to talk about third act. I think we can all sense the feeling of our presenters when Kathy saw that shocking bad news about the Senate and I uh, and the, uh, closing down the open hearings for remote participants while we were looking forward to a petition that would push the assembly to open their hearings again. And I, I think I, I while I was listening to the Q&A and feeling your disappointment and, and all of our disappointment in a thing like that, I just want to say, uh, Janet, I remembered something that you told us in the first session, which was that the opposition is powerful. It is well-funded. Uh, it's about their profits. But every win for that reason is a hard-fought win. And that was very motivating to me when you said it. And I hope it will re-inspire or reinvigorate everyone who got kind of overwhelmed with bad news just this afternoon from that surprising and bad news uh, shock. Because, uh, yeah, our or, that's why we're doing this work. It has to be done because there are, there are odds against us, but it's the right thing to do. And I believe that more and more people, especially after 2023, with the hottest year on the planet, I do believe that more and more people will be joining us. So um, I know it was disappointing, but it is not going to put us down. Um, what I intended to say was first and foremost to thank you, Janet, Mary, and Kathy for your outstanding presentations this afternoon. And thanks to all the participants who put in your excellent questions. Um, a little bit about Third Act. We are a national organization with 70,000 members nationwide, just two years old, so growing all the time. And in California, we have 9,000 members. The slide that didn't come up, I'm not sure what happened to it. Oh, here it is. Wait, it did come up. Thank you so much. So you can see that we have what uh, is called our California Legislative Committee. And it permits us to speak as one voice whenever we speak on behalf of any legislation. Um, watch for action alerts via email, sign on to letters provided by our leadership, and we have resources and expertise to help us advocate. Uh, the names, e emails, and the working group that each representative serves is, are listed. I couldn't uh, include the Bay Area emails because unfortunately Marianne and Becky were not able to get back in touch with us. I know Marianne is still on vacation and wouldn't post their emails without their permission. But if you're in the Bay Area, I'm sure you can reach them. We really encourage you, if you're a third actor, to look to the Legislative Committee for leadership and advocacy. This committee provides us with a structure and process for identifying bills, providing action alerts, and submitting letters to sign on to. And through the work of this committee, we are able to speak with a unified voice. This approach to advocacy is very beneficial, and, and there is a similar process for most organizations. You would not want to represent yourself as speaking for your organization on any of your individual letters of communication with legislators, and certainly that's true for third actors. But the strength of having a legislative committee such as ours is that we do have experienced and expert resources in a, in a coordinated process, which helps us advocate effectively together. I know I certainly depend upon their guidance and expertise all the time. And I firmly believe, just as Kathy was saying, that the strength of our organizations and our partnerships 
will help us get bills we care about passed in 2024. I hope these two legislative training sessions have prepared each of you to feel more ready and motivated to participate in this important process. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you all and uh, have a good night and a happy new year.